Once again, it is my pleasure to uh, chair the second half of this uh, session on, on the von Bekishi Symposium on the mechanisms of hearing along the footsteps of uh, Georg von Bekishi. Uh, it is my great honor and privilege to announce the next speaker, who is uh, Professor Dolores Bozovic uh, from the UCLA Center for Biological Physics. She will talk about the sensitivity and tuning uh, in hair cells of the inner ear, and she will also hold her presentation online. So, Professor Bozovic, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining, uh, joining us. Um, thank you for that um, kind introduction. Let me uh, share the screen, and hopefully you are able all to see it. Um, I'm able to see it, so I trust that so is everybody else. Um, so thank you for the for the invitation to speak at this at this meeting. Um, I wish I could be there in person in the beautiful Budapest, but um, this time at least we'll have to do with with Zoom. Uh, like so many um, uh, other groups, including previous speakers, uh, I'm interested in the sensitivity uh, of these hair cells and their tremendous mechanical um, uh, detection ability and tuning. By which I don't mean I should clarify. I don't mean uh, frequency tuning. Uh, but tuning of this control parameter mentioned uh, previously uh, uh, in Jim's talk, some sort of tuning of responsiveness of sensitivity and so on in response to external environment. Um, I uh, bring, however, different sort of tools to this problem in, the, in, in that I'm a physicist by training. I'm in the Department of uh, Physics um, uh, uh, at UCLA. And so I'm trying to ask so, so these questions from a physics perspective and approaching it in a slightly different way, uh, in particular, when I say sensitivity, the thing that I find mind-boggling uh, isn't only that they can extract, you know, three angstroms of displacement, that's fascinating enough, but that they do this, you know, in the presence of noise. So, you know, we can do crazy things with amazing detectors, but we have to cool them down to 10 millikelvin. Uh, we have to do so many manipulations to, to eliminate noise. Uh, and the biological system does this in, in situations where the noise is comparable uh, or in, in, in certain circumstances even higher than the signal that is extracted. So to me, this is the, the, the question that's uh, even more fascinating than, than, than the question of sensitivity. Um, but secondly, um, uh, the dynamic range, which you know spans a million fold in the pressure that enters the U canal, uh, is partly explained, of course, by the compressive nonlinearity. Uh, but it is still fascinating that it can um, uh, be there in a sense that the, the, the mechanism that is so delicate as to be able to respond to angstroms at the same time does not break uh, at the other limit. So. To me, this question of robustness on one hand and sensitivity of the other are really sort of flip sides of the same question. And I'm um, trying to figure out how the same thing can, the same detector can operate uh, uh, over such a range. And um, I do believe that some sort of feedback mechanism, some kind of tuning of this, these control parameters uh, has to be the answer above and beyond the compressive nonlinearity. Uh, secondly, the, or thirdly, I should say the, the temporal resolution here you show a picture of one such animal that shows something like 10 microsecond uh, sensitivity to interoral time difference. Um, means that each hair cell has to not scramble that information. Its response has to be fast, uh, or at least, uh, well, and accurate, right? So, so uh, in order to be able to, you know, uh, elements downstream to be able to compare them, we have to not lose that information at the very, at the very beginning of detection. So. Um, the speed of response of the hair cell, I feel, hasn't received as much attention. And again, I'm particularly interested in comparing, in this case, the first and the third. Uh, how can a system that is simultaneously that sensitive, uh, that has maintained its sensitivity, also reach such temporal resolution? So uh, we perform experiments on our the favorite, uh, our favorite uh, biological preparation, which was developed in Jim Hutzpitt's lab, uh, and that's the bullfrog saculus. We look at the, these hair cells in vitro. And the thing that's so uh, awesome about these cells is they're extremely robust. So we can poke them, prod them, zap them electrically, put on chemicals. We can torture these cells in various ways in order to extract the, the mechanisms underneath. And so they allow us to perform these highly invasive measurements that some of the other preparations would not. Um, we do this, so we, we bathe them in solutions that mimic, to the best of our ability, what they see in vivo. We image them optically, everything is done optically. Uh, and then we record things with a high-speed camera, uh, and that is that records their, their motion, their response. Uh, and this gives you an idea of what uh, the upper right-hand corner shows the 
um, top-down view of a single hair bundle. Uh, as we record it in each frame, we can fit uh, sort of a distribution. We can figure out what the intensity profile is to extract uh, with fair amount of precision the, the location of the uh, bundle. Uh, this is sometimes referred as, to as super resolution microscopy. I actually don't like that term because it's really not resolution we're talking about, it's precision. We're trying to figure out where in one frame it's positioned and then we track it over frames. We're not trying to resolve two hair bundles, they're far apart. Um, so uh, we can get something like nanometer precision in tracking these movements, even though the, the recordings are optical. Uh, at the same time, we can scan across the sacs. That's what you see in this uh, uh, left-hand side. If we, in some of our experiments, we want to look at coupling or correlations between bundles. We can also track multiple hair bundles. Uh, here's a video which ran well yesterday. Here it is now. The, the colors, of course, uh, artistic interpretation. The red means high, the blue means uh, low. Uh, but the trace below shows you this uh, spontaneous oscillation already mentioned in the previous talk uh, by Jim Hansbeth. And the thing that I like about this is that it combines some of my favorite topics in physics, which is, first of all, it's nonlinear. This has been discussed now by, by previous talks. I don't need to belabor it. The system is extremely nonlinear. In fact, the technical term is essential nonlinearity, which means that it remains nonlinear down to zero stimulus uh, amplitude. Uh, so it weak signals, it's nonlinear. This is what's, what's so unusual and, and cool about it. So it immediately brings in nonlinear dynamics rather than linear mechanics. Uh, and the fact that it is active, it's energy consuming in order to oscillate even on its own in the absence of a stimulus, uh, it also amplifies the stimuli applied. The fact that it's active immediately means that we can throw out uh, equilibrium thermodynamics because it's at equilibrium when it's dead. Um, so while it's alive and active, uh, it's uh, in non it's out of equilibrium. And so this is a beautiful branch of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, uh, which we can also uh, uh, apply here. Um, I also want to make a, you know, one 30 second detour here. I'm going to be again talking only about the bullfrog saculus, but these spontaneous oscillations have been seen in a number of other species. This is just in our lab. We have seen it in amphibian papilla. Uh, we have seen it in the bullfrog utricle and then in the toke gecko saculus. So uh, uh, pretty much wherever we've been able to get a, a reasonable preparation, we've seen them. Um, in other laboratories, they've also been seen in fish and a number of other species. So I don't think that these uh, this phenomena is specific for some reason to the bullfrog saculus. Uh, it is ubiquitous. It has been seen in a number of species. And we believe it, again, this has been mentioned earlier, but uh, given the, the prevalence of autoacoustic emissions, spontaneous autoacoustic emissions in other species, something has got to be oscillating inside, right, if it is to be generating uh, these emissions. So we do believe that they're probably there everywhere in certain regimes. Now, whether the system is oscillating under all conditions or not, perhaps not. Perhaps the system can tune itself uh, uh, to different positions, but that there exist regimes where a system will oscillate on its own, uh, I believe is going to be the case in every species. First of all, you just need two degrees of freedom or more in order to get a limit cycle oscillation for an active system. So you know, biological systems have many, so there's no reason to think that the, the phase space would not contain a limit cycle. So again, I just want uh, you know, to make a point that, that limit cycles is not something obscure that uh, that's weird and doesn't occur frequently. No, uh, you just need two degrees of freedom. Um, Mechanical stimulation, everything I'll be talking about in this talk will use the top, um, uh, the, the, the methodology illustrated in the top figure, which is glass probes mounted on piezos. Uh, for everything that, that I'll be talking about here, we don't need any uh, really high frequencies. For certain experiments um, uh, in my group, we've also used magnetic nanoparticles, so I just mentioned that technique here, since uh, uh, it's applicable to certain um, uh, uh, other, other experiments. But uh, like I said, here I'll focus on the top one. And with that uh, stimulus, what we do is we apply typically a sine wave. This is one of our favorite, or not always, uh, uh, to, the, to the tip of the bundle. And here, for example, in this boxed area, you see in black the stimulus applied, exaggerated tenfold because otherwise you would have a hard time uh, seeing it. Um, and then the red uh, shows you here the, the oscillation. And what you can see is that at some frequencies and at some amplitude, it entrains. It phase locks the frequencies. In others, it entrains it partially. It entrains and then phase slips and then entrains again. In some situations, it trains beautifully. And so this study of the phase locking property is one of the things we use the most. Uh, it's amazing how much you can extract when you go back and forth between theoretical predictions and this phase locking dynamics 
uh, you can really test back and forth and, and tease out some of the, the sort of uh, mechanisms and properties. So the, one of the uh, old measurements that we did, I mean, not told, but about 10 years ago, uh, this is a so-called Arnold tongue in, in dynamical systems literature. So it's well known in math that a uh, certain class of systems shows this sort of triangular behavior in the sense that if you apply frequency, you, you scan the frequency, here it's uh, uh, up to about 50 hertz, roughly the range of, of the saculus, and then uh, we increase the amplitude applied to the base of the probe. This actually translated into fairly few picomutants applied. And then you, you bury the whole phase space in that sense, you know, the physiological regime. Uh, and you, what we're plotting here is the phase-locked component of the response. So red means that it's all phase-locked. Blue doesn't mean that the cell is not moving. It's oscillating on, spontaneously with fairly high amplitude, uh, but it's ignoring the signal. So this is a way not so much to tell how much the cell is moving, but how much it is being entrained. There are different metrics of this um, here. I like to use this one, which is sort of extracting which fraction, which is the amplitude that is of the oscillation that is phase locked and not uh, uh, taking the whole into account. Uh, there are different ways like vector strengths and so on to look at this. And so what this is telling you is that, of course, at its favorite frequency, you can see this kind of peak uh, or the bottom of the, the, the tip uh, tells you that at its favorite frequency, the characteristic frequency, it'll entrain very easily at very weak amplitude. As you go up in amplitude, at some point it entrains no matter what the frequency is, because of course you're driving it fast. So this is the Arnold tongue, and we've looked at the so-called normal form equation for the hot bifurcation, discussed uh, already in a previous talk. And again, I, I won't belabor the math too much, although I have to describe some of it. Um, this is the most generic version of the bifurcation. So Z, again, is some generalized variable. The real component of it describes the movement of the bundle. So dz dt, this is looking at how that changes time, some sort of generalized velocity, if you will, how it's responding. Mu is this magical control parameter, which I'll mention later in the talk much more, but it's something that sets it. Is it is it quiescent or is it oscillatory, as mentioned previously? Omega naught is its favorite frequency. This z z squared times z, that's actually z cubed. That's the cubic nonlinearity, which when flipped gives you the one-third power law. Um, that's been measured across uh, different branches of this field. And then this alpha and I beta, again, forgive the, the complex notation, we, we physicists love it. Um, and yes, there are ways to compare data to, a, to, to an equation like this, because you can separate it into components and look at it separately. And I'll mention a little bit that. Uh, and so this alpha plus I beta, there are two parameters. We call them alpha and beta because we like Greek alphabet uh, in, in this field. They're, they're useful symbols. And so um, they're just some parameters that, again, control how strong this nonlinearity is. The F sub Z, that's, that allows us to put in the external force. Most of the field actually sets this up, ignores this beta term. Uh, but this is the most generic um, version of the equation. And so this, this prediction, as has been mentioned, it, it describes the frequency selectivity, the, the amplification, the existence of the limit cycle oscillation, uh, and the uh, uh, compression. So it, it uh, uh, describes so much and so elegantly with this one equation. And it also tells you that this mu control parameter can set its, its uh, sensitivity. You can make it extremely sensitive or not sensitive at all by changing this mu parameter. The part that has always worried me, I felt that there was one thing that I did not like in this, the only thing I would say that I did not like in this equation is that if you tune it precisely at the bifurcation, so that in this case is mu equal to zero, but doesn't matter, whatever the critical point is, in the vicinity of the critical point, there's something called critical slowing down. And that's a phenomenon, it, it sort of it is what it sounds like. With zero noise, it would mean that you would take infinitely long time to write at the bifurcation to respond. This is what's called critical slowing down. In the presence of noise, the bifurcation is smeared a little bit, and so you wouldn't have infin infinite slowing down, but you'd still have pretty significant slowing down. And so there is a little bit of an inherent trade-off between how fast uh, the system can respond and how sensitive it is. Now, that does not invalidate this, this uh, uh, in, in, interpretation at all. In fact, I think that the system sometimes might care more about one or the other and tune itself differently. Uh, also, these trade-offs are part of biology. So this isn't necessarily wrong at all. In fact, I think this, this framework is, is uh, correct. But I wanted to see if there is a regime where these two are not fighting each other. Does there exist a regime described by the same equation, which has been so confirmed experimentally and so across so many different levels, right, from in vivo to in vitro measurements. So how can we sort of uh, explain this? And so 
uh, uh, field of nonlinear dynamics to the rescue, there is some phenomenon known, known as chaos. Chaotic systems have captured the popular imagination and have, um, I think, been talked about a lot, largely, I would say wrongly, because um, the word chaos just, I think, is one of those misnomers in this field. Uh, in English, the word chaos implies, you know, mess, something completely, um, well, you know, even the word chaotic, right, means there, there's um, no structure, no form to it, right? This could not be further from truth. The mathematical word chaos refers to the most beautifully structured systems right, with universal constants and so on. The part that gave you the name is that system that is chaotic loses predictability very rapidly. What does that mean? There's something called exponential divergence of trajectories. What does that mean? We start with trajectories a little tiny bit near each other so, it's, so that small ping can move from one to the other, and over time they diverge. Um, this exponential divergence of trajectories is kind of the technical definition almost of, of uh, or part of the technical definition of chaos. And this has led to the popular, again, interpretation of a butterfly flaps its wings, you know, on the other side of the world, it can cause a tornado here, right? Um, hopefully it won't happen during the duration of my talk, right? This is more or less, this kind of gets some of the flavor of it, but I think, again, doesn't capture uh, uh, all of it. And in particular, the however, you know, a, a fixed point that's a repellent, right, or an unstable limit cycle would we'll do the same. Would we'll do the same thing. Trajectories would go away to infinity, uh, not necessarily exponentially, but they would diverge for sure. Um, but that's not a chaotic system. So chaotic system also uh, maintains a what's what's called you know a bounded uh, attractor. What it means is that it stays in a certain confined part of space. It doesn't just go off to infinity. However, the trajectories never cross. So you can see this gorgeous is one example of a famous this is the, the, the Lorenz attractor. Uh, it has this kind of fractal structure. This is its, its trajectory. It's a tractor, the trajectory it wants to go to. Um, and it never crosses. It goes closer and closer and closer, but how, whatever scale you look at, it never crosses. If it ever crosses, you have a limit cycle, because once you have a loop, however complicated, it's a loop, then it's a limit cycle. Right? So it never crosses, but it remains bounded in space. And so these two kind of div exponential divergence, I should also say, is therefore only talks about short time scales, short term scales. Over long term, it, it, it levels off, it saturates. Right? So these two combined define chaos for us. And the key, again, apologies for the mathy, mathy uh, interlude, but uh, this is this is all I'm going to say about chaos. Well, not quite all, almost all. Um, What's important is this extreme sensitivity. Look, you ping it a little bit, for, uh, uh, that could be signal instead of noise also, and the trajectories respond by a big effect. So it can be extremely sensitive. And there, there's been writing in neuroscience on, you know, about the edge of chaos, describing certain states. So I think that chaos is beginning to be appreciated for what it, you know, what it can do for a sensory system. Uh, secondly, it's exponentially fast. So there is no trade-off between these two requirements. Let's now look at the equation again. I apologize for the highly unpronounceable term. I can't pronounce it well uh, after all this time. Non-isochronicity, I believe, is the correct way to say it. Uh, and it's a fancy word for, to just say that if, again, we look at the same equation, and we don't want to deal about with the complex notation, so we separate it into coordinates that describe the radius of the oscillation and then the, the, the angular velocity. And if this beta, this is a parameter. If we set that parameter to zero, the system is what's called isochronous, which means that the oscillation frequency is fixed. It's some omega naught. It does not care what radius it's oscillating at. It can be big radius or small radius, the frequency is the same. The technical term for that is isochronous, and that is the case that has been mostly studied in this field uh, with the application of the, the Hall bifurcation um, framework. So if we make it non-isochronous, which means that you're mixing these degrees of freedom, that the, the frequency is at least somewhat weakly affected by how um, the, the, what the radius of the oscillation is. Once you mix these two degrees of freedom, so the frequency cares about the size of the oscillation, once you mix them in, um, the system is non-isochronous. And we have shown, and actually this is there are other, other examples of this in this field, which is if you add some noise to the system, to the same bifurcation, same equation, Normal form equation plus noise, but non-isochronous case, uh, you get chaos. Here's an example of this kind of fractal attractor. And um, we've tested this in a number of different ways. I was just say tested uh, um, numerically. Yeah. Uh, and so in my group, we almost use this non-isochronous and chaotic interchangeably because you always have noise. 
But what's nice is that gave me the idea, or actually the 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 this is getting the chronology perhaps a little long, but wrong, but um uh suspicion that chaos might be there in the hair bundle. Uh, led us on this path to try to prove uh, uh, whether it, or first determine and then pr uh, whether it's there and then test whether it's good or bad for the system. Right? In either case, right, if it's uh, if it's detrimental, how does the system overcome it? If it's helpful, how is it helpful? So the first question, how, how do you determine chaos? Turns out it's uh, uh, fairly easy in a, a simulation, fairly difficult with data to distinguish it from noise, just from white noise or stochastic noise. So um, we did in this work, we did something like seven different uh, uh, tests of it from the mathematical literature. Um, and they're all consistently saying that, yes, so I'm going to give away the punchline. Yes, there's a chaotic attractor. But I'll show just one way, which is one of the most rigorous ways and which we then used in our experimental study. So you can strobe your oscillation. Uh, and you can see these red dots. We decided to use an, as an event um, that we're strobing the opening of the channels. We look at the intervals between the subsequent opening and draw a map. How does one interval depend on the other? If it's perfectly phase lock, if it's a perfectly limited cycle, it'll give you a point because each uh, interval depends on the other in the same way. They're all the same. Um, and if it's completely white noise, you get a cloud. And in between, and so this is what we measure. We get a cloud when we start with a very weak signal. And then you start to get this ring structure. This means that the oscillation, the, the trajectory follows something that's uh, like a torus. This is the so-called quasi-periodic transition. And then these are the Poincaré maps. As we increase it, it collapses onto a point, as we expect. So we look at these transitions. And if it's a non-chaotic transition, this transition should be smooth. And if we look at one angle, how one angle on these points, then we measure these angles of these points. So kind of like a map of maps. We get um, these kind of uh, uh, dependence. And so if it's a non-chaotic system, it should be a smooth function. Uh, or I should say it should be a function. There's a one, you know, there's one y point for any one x. And if it isn't, if it's a chaotic system, or if it shows what's called torus breakdown, this is again the, the technical math term, uh, you get a non-function. And so the red points, which is a weak signal, nine picognons, shows us this torus breakdown. And so that's one of the signatures of chaos. So we're pretty convinced that we have chaos, we have a chaotic attractor in our hair bundle oscillations. We next look at that number, the NFE's normal form equation plus noise, simplest model we can use. And then we did a theoretical work uh, study uh, where we wanted to see, now going back to those questions from the beginning of the talk, we increase Lyapunov exponent. That means increasing chaos. So the chaos knob is going up along the y direction. Let's look at part A. Uh, it's going up in the y direction, increasing chaos. To the right, we're increasing the noise strength just white noise. And then we're applying a small signal, and here we're plotting the sensitivity. Sensitivity is defined by a lot of other work uh, uh, in the field, including Pascal Martins and, and so on, is um, response or movement of the bundle divided by the forcing sense. So it's the sensitivity. Uh, and that's one of the metrics that has been used the most, and it's the, one, the first one that we looked at. And what we find, according to theories, that at biological noise strength, which is something between, it's 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 roughly where I'm pointing with the cursor, so between 0 and 0 0.1, uh, thereabouts, uh, the uh, optimal regime is the weakly chaotic regime. That's where we get the most sensitivity. So this was nice. Um, uh, this was uh, sort of the first uh, uh, indication that maybe there's, there's something to this um, chaoticity that's actually conducive to det detection. What's also cool is that as you increase the noise strength, even above the biological levels, uh, it's fairly robust. You know, at some point you smear it out, but it's fairly robust. The sensitivity is not vastly or suddenly degraded by noise. Even around this time, I was also starting to think that perhaps we should, you know, looking at sensitivity is not the right answer. It's still looking at the bundle as a purely mechanical system, right? It's like a rubber band. Okay, it's a nonlinear rubber band. Okay, it's not only a rubber band with a motor, so it's a cool rubber band, but still it's looking at it kind of like how much does it move in response to signal. And I was beginning to think that maybe the right way to think of a hair bundle and even detection is more like a computer, which is its job isn't just to move, its job is to extract information from the signal. So we started looking at here, we're plotting what's called transfer entropy. It's very related, it's my favorite metric for this, but it's related to um, mutual information, which I think is more, more widely known. It's a way to basically ask how much information is the is the bundle uh, extracting uh, by uh, receiving the signal. 
And uh, again, we, we vary the chaos, we vary the noise, and now we're plotting this transfer entropy. So we're now trying to get a different measure of sensitivity that isn't purely mechanical, but like I said, computational. If you will. And again, we find that it's optimal in, in, the, in the weekly chaotic regime over a really broad range. Um, I'll, I'll skip this part. I'll just point out actually that the response time of the bundle goes down. So again, the Aponov exponent, we're now increasing chaos in the x direction and just plotting the speed of response or response time. And the response time decreases, which means it's much faster as chaos increases. This is just confirming the predictions. Now we just needed, actually, um, before I go on, now we just needed to verify this experimentally. And I thought, you know, good luck. I, I need a chaos knob right? in the hair bundle, right? How do I turn up chaoticity and down? Well, it turns out it's calcium. And anyone who's worked with hair cells is hopefully chuckling because chaos affects, uh, sorry, calcium affects everything. So it turns out it affects chaos as well. Um, other, we've used other knobs as well. Uh, viscosity of the surrounding solutions can also change it. But how do we do this? We start with low calcium. So look at this, this uh, uh, left column. And we look at, again, the point gray maps, and we get this perfectly uh, reasonable, smooth uh, function, which means there is no chaos um, uh, because there's no torus breakdown. So be careful, don't use overly low calcium in your experiments or you might lose the chaos. Um, and the natural calcium solution, again, I, I am going with the consensus in the field as to what natural is, uh, does show chaos and higher calcium uh, solutions show chaos. So this gave us one knob to change the degree of, of chaos in the actual hair bundle and show that indeed, again, we're on the x-axis is now we're varying um, we're here just for varying the level of coma government. It's it's a different metric of chaos that's uh, more suitable to experiments. And we find that, again, weak chaos, you can see this peak in sensitivity is, again, observed in the weekly chaotic level. The broad peak that we see in transfer entropy, which is, again, this information theory approach uh, to extracting sensitivity, is also showing a peak in weak chaos. And we see this exponential decay. So everything pretty much fits. Quick summary, there's a chaotic attractor, it enhances sensitivity, it's robust to noise, and um, there's no critical slowing down. The, the speed of response is maintained. Uh, I won't mention much on the coupling. I'll just say that we looked at then artificially coupled uh, hair cells. We interfaced artificial structures with hair bundles and measured how they synchronize. Turns out that synchronization is also helped by chaos. So not only are the individual bundles more sensitive, but despite vast frequency dispersion, this is one thing that's difficult in the saccules. You have very big differences in frequency over fairly short distances. And yet, even despite, they, they really should just either stop oscillating, quench each other, or not synchronize. But if it's a non-isochronous system or chaotic system, that helps synchronization. So it improves synchronization amongst bundles. It also leads to new states, uh, which are states of partial synchronization. So groups synchronize to each other. Uh, or one group synchronizes, the others don't. So these different states could, I think, explain some of the um, peaks in the spontaneous autoacoustic spectra, which people haven't necessarily been able to fully explain. I mean, there are different um, uh, theoretical works out there, but we think this can actually help. This idea of part frequency clustering in particular would lead to certain groups um, synchronizing to each other. And this partial synchronization also can lead to uh, really high sensitivity. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to spend much time. I'll spend maybe about three minutes uh, on this final topic, which is, as I mentioned, I really think that the dynamic range and the sensitivity, particularly if something is tuning perhaps the system to a critical point, away from critical point, into chaotic regime, into quiescent regime in response, what is this dynamic control? So, of course, uh, a lot of biological in vivo measurements tell us that it's efferent neurons. But I really wanted to open this up and look at what does an efferent do, neuron do to one hair bundle? How does it affect the mechanical movement and sensitivity of the actual sensor? Um, there was no reason to assume that it will be there. You know, it could all be somewhere else downstream. But um, we found that indeed, uh, if we zap, so this shows you briefly the experimental setup. It's the same as before. We just zapped the uh, the whole eighth cranial nerve inserted in the in this uh, uh, suction electrode. And we find that if we zap the neuron, the efferent neurons, 
we are, so here we're sending a signal, just a step function, right? The simplest possible signal we can. You see this vast change in the limit cycle oscillation. So it's affecting the mechanics of the bundle very drastically, right? The effect is not subtle, as you can see. The oscillation is still there. It's almost suppressed by the really high uh, levels of stimulus, but um, the effect is instantaneous and reversible. It's eliminated if we block here. It's just showing you a control experiment. Strychnine blocks the acetylcholine channel. So if we block the channel, so it is, it is going through the, the, it's exerting its effect via acetylcholine. And then this is kind of the main uh, point I want to make. Remember those Arnold tongue shapes? This tells you how the system responds across frequency and amplitudes. On the left-hand side, we have the unstimulated bundle. It's nice and responsive. It's very sensitive. We zap it with different, and the, and the response almost goes away. There's a tiny sliver at really high amplitudes, but it basically doesn't move. Remember, it's still oscillating. It's not that it stopped moving. It stops in training. It's ignoring the signal while difference are being zapped. Um, this persists at higher amplitudes, and then it's reversible. It's not the difference simply somehow killed them or, or destroyed their uh, ability to respond. So it's a fully reversible effect. Uh, this just shows you some slices to sort of show how drastic the, the effect is. This is the, the top is the response without difference, and then it's completely flattened and reduced um, by the presence of difference. Um, one final thing that we wanted to ask is how can we test the overstimulus effect? Again, lots of in vivo data show that if you sever, you know, the, the, if the efferents are uh, damaged uh, or severed, lesioned, um, the damage due to mechanical stimulus, this loud sound, is, is highly uh, enhanced. So there's evidence that it protects us from, um, from damage. So how do we do this in vivo? Again, I love bullfrog-saccular cells because we can deflect them by like a micron, something utterly brutal, hold them there for a while. This is sort of a simplified version of overstimulus, and then let go. And what we observe is it's it's quiescent. This is not just um, viscosity. It's going much slower than, than just the viscous uh, drag would imply, which means that the myosin motors have been completely um, detuned from their normal state and are now slowly climbing to bring it back into position. During that state, it's quiescent. Here you can see on the bottom, you can see the flattened out curves. So it doesn't oscillate while it's deflected and then slowly recovers and then does the oscillations. So in the flattened curves, you can see this transition, right? This is sort of where we're watching the hop bifurcation crossing uh, in real time, right? It goes from quiescent to oscillatory as some internal mechanism. I was assuming it was the Madison motors uh, reset the, the, the state. And then, so on the right-hand side, we have a repeat of this experiment. You see, we, these are four different um, uh, cells, actually, four different uh, deflected and returning. We see the same effect with slightly different oscillation uh, profiles. On the left-hand side is the same measurement, but with different stimulus, and we see something completely different. Even, we can see it in the deflected, uh, in the raw data, but it's even better in the flattened curves, where we've taken out the slow component. What's amazing is it's offset by hundreds of nanometers when you let go. It's completely been detuned and it still starts to oscillate immediately. So this suppression of oscillation, this transition into quiescence does not occur if the efferents um, are stimulated. So we're seeing in vitro, right, the brain's been thrown out. There's nothing um, more than just this one um, uh, stump of the, the cranial nerve, but that's being zapped. And yet, even at the level of this uh, mechanical detector, we're seeing this really, really strong effect uh, of efferent stimulus. So summary, they change the bundle oscillations, they kill the sensitivity of response, and they seem to completely change the response to the overstimulus. They eliminate the quiescence uh, that's induced normally. Um, I won't talk much about the future directions. We, of course, want to now dig deeper into the chaotic dynamics, dig deeper into the efferent mechanisms. How is it actually doing this? And one of the things I really want to do is merge these two together because I hypothesize that efferents might be tuning the cell chaotic, non-chaotic, um, uh, and so on. Uh, finally, I want to push further this sort of information theoretic approach to the hair bundle mechanics. I think that that may be the right way to think of the bundle, more so than just uh, looking at the purely mechanical responsiveness, which is what uh, uh, we've all been been looking at before. Uh, because again, it's a different way to 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 think of detection, even right, uh, of the cell. 
And um, I just want to thank uh, some of my current laboratory members and the funding agencies, of course. And um, finally, thank you for, for, again, the invitation uh, to speak here. Uh, and hopefully next time I can be there in person. Thank you very much. Uh, in, for the sake of time, just a very quick question from the audience. If I may then, just a quick question. What is tinnitus in light of your chaotic model? Um, you know, tinnitus is probably uh, a downstream effect, uh, I think, because it's not like autoacoustic emissions. You can put a microphone in the ear and detect it. So it's really there. It's something oscillating. With tinnitus, you don't detect it. You hear it, but you're not detecting it. So I'm, my, my suspicion is that uh, this is not, um, the oscillations of the bundle are not related to it. No mechanics in it. Okay. Well, so once again, thank you very much. I just want to show you that uh, uh, you will be sent um, a, a diploma and a certificate and a medal with uh, von Bekish's uh, uh, picture and your name in, uh, engraved on the back. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. So with that, we turn to our next speaker, uh, who is... Uh, Dr. Tibor Zelash from Semmelweis University and the Department of Oral Biology and Department of Pharmacology and Pharmacotherapy. And uh, the title of the presentation is Seeking During, Seeking, uh, sorry, Seeking Drug Therapy for Sensory Neural Hearing Losses. Tibor, please. Yeah. Should I share or how can I share this? Yeah, I would like to thank uh, for the organizers uh, for my invitation. Uh, I will talk uh, about uh, uh, a bit a different approach uh, uh, compared to the previous uh, uh, lecturers. So we are seeking drugs uh, for treating the sensory neural hearing uh, losses, which is a, a, a great problem influencing a lot of uh, people and causing problems uh, for our society. I think uh, Immanuel Kant uh, made a nice uh, uh, summary of this, that uh, not being uh, able, to see, uh, able to see isolate uh, you from object and not being able to hear isolates you from people. So that's a great uh, problem. Uh, and the seriousness of this problem is prognostized. Uh, to be uh, increased in the near future. Hearing loss uh, is believed uh, to will belong uh, into the uh, first uh, 15 uh, highest uh, uh, burden disease uh, in the near uh, future. Uh, we are focusing on sensory neural hearing uh, losses, uh, affecting uh, the cochlea and uh, the projection to the brain and brain uh, processing. These uh, hearing losses uh, uh, cause uh, the problems uh, with no treatment uh, nowadays uh, except uh, the prosthesis. The background of these diseases uh, share uh, many similarities, excitotoxicity, neurodegeneration, apoptosis, and the imbalance of the reactive oxygen species uh, and uh, even the immune system uh, dysfunction is believed behind uh, these diseases. And as I mentioned, there is no uh, evidence-based medicine nowadays, except one, an acute corticosteroid uh, intratympanic application, but besides that, no effective pharmacotherapy uh, right now. Uh, we are uh, using uh, mice uh, in our uh, study, and yeah, I know uh, that mouse mice are not uh, humans, but uh, even just having a look uh, on the audiograms of uh, humans uh, and mouse, uh, it's easy to recognize uh, the similarity. And even in a previous talk, uh, we got uh, 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 similarities of genetic defects between the humans uh, and mice. 
So our uh, subject is uh, the mice, and uh, uh, the cornerstones uh, of drug discovery is uh, finding the right target, target selection, uh, selecting the right clinical candidate, the compound, and a good clinical study, uh, including proper patient selection, which requires uh, the correct uh, knowledge of pathomechanism uh, of the disease. We are uh, primarily uh, focusing on this first two uh, cornerstone uh, of drug uh, discovery. We set up uh, the mice mouse model of the three most prominent uh, form of sensor and neural hearing losses, the drug-induced uh, hearing loss, the noise-induced one, and the age-dependent uh, one. To measure the function uh, of hearing in vivo, we are using uh, the auditory brainstem response uh, measurement. Uh, okay, this is an evoked potential measurement also used uh, in humans. Uh, in humans, we call it a uh, better uh, measurement. So in the first uh, uh, model with aminoglycosid uh, 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 an antibiotic causing uh, hearing loss, uh, we tested a small molecule, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor, uh, rosagilin. It's on the market, so this, is, uh, this approach was a repositioning uh, approach. Uh, this uh, figure shows you a different frequencies uh, of mice uh, hearing. 16 kilohertz is the sensitivity uh, max uh, uh, of mice. And as you see, uh, this black uh, columns shows how uh, the drug uh, damages worsen uh, the hearing. The threshold shift uh, increases, and you also can see uh, that uh, the tested small molecular drugs uh, inhibited uh, this uh, worsening uh, of hearing function. This inhibitor reaction uh, of the drug was uh, dose-dependent. Uh, beside that this drug uh, has neuroprotective, uh, anti-apoptotic, and uh, antioxidant uh, activity, uh, we uh, recognized uh, and showed that rosagilin also enhances uh, the release of dopamine from the lateral oligochoral efferent neurons. There is a built-in protective system in uh, our auditory system, and the main protective uh, transmitter is dopamine. It was shown that inhibits uh, the uh, excitotoxic uh, damaging nerve firing uh, uh, evoked by, for example, uh, high noise. So dopamine uh, was proved to have a protective uh, action. Uh, my uh, first uh, tutor, Professor Vizi, with uh, Anita Gaborian, uh, were the first to show uh, providing a neurochemical evidence uh, on this dopamine uh, release, and we investigated uh, the possibilities of modulating of uh, this protective uh, dopamine release. And in the case of the, uh, this compound, we also proved that uh, in a dose-dependent manner, it enhances uh, the release of this uh, protective uh, dopamine, what could be uh, an extra uh, mechanism behind this protective action. We tested another uh, relative of uh, rosagilin, salagilin, another uh, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor, also uh, having antioxidant uh, properties and mo uh, inhibitory uh, effect, and we seen uh, the same and even more uh, emphasized uh, protective uh, action. Selegilin uh, was tested in our uh, noise-induced hearing model uh, as well. Its effect uh, was not so uh, impressive, but even in both in the short and the longer run showed some protective uh, action. The third uh, model uh, we use is the age-dependent hearing uh, loss uh, model. Uh, different uh, species of mice shows different uh, uh, progress uh, on hearing. These are uh, uh, different uh, frequencies. Uh, we measured uh, the hearing function in Bob C mice, 
and the more uh, progressive and early onset uh, progressive hearing loss showing uh, mice, the DBA uh, mice. And as you uh, see at uh, 8 uh, and 16 kilohertz uh, frequencies, uh, this lighter blue uh, line show uh, a protection uh, with selegiline, not uh, in the other species uh, of uh, mice. Uh, to test the autoprotective effect of uh, different small uh, molecular uh, compounds uh, based on uh, these uh, potential uh, targets and uh, the mentioned in vivo sensor and your hearing loss uh, models, uh, we uh, tested and examined different uh, uh, compounds, small molecular compounds uh, of different, three different uh, pharmaceutical companies, the Gedeon Richter, the Sanofi Kinoin, and Teva Pharmaceuticals uh, as well. Based on proprietary uh, reasons, I don't go into details uh, in these uh, cases. Another approach uh, uh, we checked, the built-in uh, uh, protective uh, mechanism uh, our uh, body uh, may have. PACAP uh, is, um, uh, is a transmitter uh, with cytoprotective uh, uh, regulatory peptide uh, in the CNS and the peripheral nervous system uh, with protective uh, effect. Its protection was showed in many uh, tissues. Uh, University of Page, uh, a group uh, from University of uh, page is investigating the protective effect of uh, PACAP, and we decided to check it on the hearing function uh, and uh, check the progression of uh, hearing uh, loss in PACAP uh, knockout uh, mice. And as uh, you see on uh, the, the red uh, uh, bars, uh, the KO mice uh, shows much worse uh, hearing function, especially in the lower frequency range where they showed significant. We checked the uh, individual amplitudes at higher frequencies, 16, 32 uh, kilohertz, and if we uh, measured and checked the individual uh, amplitudes of uh, the ABR response, uh, the difference uh, between the KO and white type mice could be recognized uh, there. So back up, this endogenous molecule has a protection uh, on uh, hearing. Another uh, uh, case uh, in this uh, approach, when an endogenous uh, molecule uh, expressed protective effect was the uh, pejvacin. Uh, the defects of uh, the page working gene is causing a uh, human uh, hearing uh, loss. It's a non syndromic autosomal recessive deafness, the DFNB59. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we joined the uh, uh, French uh, uh, group. Uh, to this uh, project and showed uh, that sound exposure uh, uh, evokes a serious uh, deafness in uh, Pejwakin KO mice because of the impaired adaptation of the proliferation of uh, peroxisomes. Our uh, resort here was to show that the reactive oxygen production produced by sound and damaging uh, uh, the uh, cochlea is not coming uh, from the mitochondria. In our hemicochlear preparation, we imaged uh, the mitochondrial membrane potential and challenged it uh, with an uncoupler, but uh, see no difference either neither uh, in the organ of corti or uh, the spiral uh, ganglion uh, cells. A third uh, a component, uh, built-in component, uh, what could play a role uh, in the disease and protection uh, of hearing in the, is the immune system. In the last uh, decade, it became clear that the inner ear is not uh, an immune-privileged organ. It's full, look at these red dots, it's full with uh, immune cells, macrophages, monocytes, uh, even in the organ of uh, corti. 
and uh, this uh, immune uh, function could be inhibited or activated. And uh, there is uh, an immune checkpoint uh, inhibitor uh, group of drugs recently uh, discovered. Uh, these uh, drugs are very uh, effective uh, against uh, certain tumors like metastatic melanoma or colorectal cancers or certain lung uh, cancers. Uh, the mechanism uh, behind uh, this that uh, uh, these tumors uh, has uh, a self-tolerance against uh, the immune uh, system. Okay, but uh, with these immune checkpoint inhibitors, we can inhibit this self-tolerance. As a result, the immune system, the host immune system, will attack and kill uh, the, immu uh, the tumor uh, cells. Okay, so by blocking this, uh, in a very simple way, it's like at uh, the border of East and West uh, uh, Berlin, at Checkpoint Charlie, when the checking uh, was on, uh, the immune system, host immune system, could not attack uh, the tumor cells, but later on uh, they were liberated uh, and activated to uh, perform uh, their job. This immune checkpoint inhibitors was uh, recognized uh, just uh, recently and used uh, very efficiently. But as uh, it comes from the basic uh, idea, it activates the immune system, so it causes several autoimmune type of uh, diseases. Uh, we were interested in uh, what uh, the situation in hearing, because there were only sporadic uh, cases uh, and pharmacovigilance reports that the hearing uh, is affected. So we treated uh, our mice with these immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors and checked the hearing function. We see uh, no difference between uh, the treated and the non-treated uh, one concerning the function of hearing. Uh, this was the same result concerning the spiral ganglion cells, either apical, medial, or basal uh, turns. Uh, of the uh, cochlea. But we also uh, counted uh, the hair cells uh, in the organ of uh, corti. You can uh, recognize the tag the dead uh, hair cells and make a cochleogram. So basically, uh, to figure uh, the number of uh, outer and inner hair cells in the function uh, of uh, the tonotopy. And uh, we were surprised uh, that the anti-PD-1 antibody uh, treated mice, the uh, age-dependent uh, progressive loss of outer health cells was uh, inhibited in a certain uh, respect. And in the meantime, we see a smooth uh, enhancement of uh, macrophage uh, activity in uh, the basal uh, part uh, of uh, the cochlea, actually where the high frequencies uh, uh, are uh, present. We were surprised how we just expected uh, the opposite. Still not uh, sure what's the real explanation of this. We found in the literature one uh, work where uh, these immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, uh, produce a protective and not uh, a damaging uh, effect. The next uh, uh, approach uh, uh, we did and tried to uh, make experiment on the cellular uh, level, still playing around uh, with the immune system partly, is the purinergic uh, regulation uh, in the cochlea. The purinergic system has a major role both in the physiological and the pathophysiological uh, function of hearing and uh, this uh, uh, very stated uh, uh, knowledge that the purinergic system influence uh, the immune system, modulate uh, the immune system. This uh, table, you don't need to recognize uh, uh, the individual uh, uh, words just showing uh, that the cochlea is full with 
purinergic uh, receptors. And as I mentioned, uh, for example, uh, for loud uh, noise, the ATP concentration is enhanced in the scala media, and that uh, inhibits, decrease the sensitivity of the cochlea. And uh, in this uh, recent review, you also, uh, it's summarized uh, that the purinergic system is uh, really involved, at least in preclinical level nowadays, involved uh, in the uh, protection of uh, hearing uh, losses. So to investigate the purinergic uh, regulation and the calcium regulation, which is a major intracellular messenger purinergic system uses, uh, we applied uh, the chemical club preparation. Uh, Professor Talos uh, was kind enough uh, to teach uh, us uh, this method. He primarily used this for electrophysiological and uh, micromechanical uh, purposes. We tried to uh, set up uh, f uh, to use this uh, preparation for functional imaging. So we loaded uh, the cells with a calcium dye and uh, really used the pure energetic uh, uh, agonist to uh, evoke uh, a dose-dependent uh, calcium response. And we showed that uh, it's repeatedly uh, uh, activated these cells. At the first uh, set of uh, approach, we used the bulk loading of this calcium indicator. But the time uh, to do this and the signal to noise uh, is not so uh, perfect. So we introduced uh, uh, Helmchen uh, single cell electroporation method uh, he used in uh, neuroscience. We applied it to load up uh, with this electroporation individual cells in the organ uh, of Corti. You see the difference. This is the much noisy bulk loading. And this is the single cell electroporation loaded, much higher signal to noise uh, uh, result. Uh, with this approach, we even can uh, make subcellular uh, imaging. This is a data cell when you can see separately, image separately, the soma and the process uh, of that cell. We proved uh, uh, as well here that uh, different uh, supporting. Uh, cells uh, type at different uh, turns, apical, middle, or basal turn. This is the nice tonotopy, uh, beautiful tonotopy uh, of the cochlea. So uh, we set up this method uh, to investigate this uh, pure energic uh, signaling. And let me repeat that this pure energic system has a protective role uh, in against uh, hearing uh, losses. So summarizing uh, uh, the experiment uh, results, what I wanted uh, to show uh, you, we use drugs uh, inhibiting uh, the reactive oxygen system imbalance, inhibiting toxicity, apoptosis, and showing neuroprotective uh, action. Small molecules we used uh, for these purposes. And another approach uh, with uh, the modulation and activation of endogenous protective mechanism, like uh, the lateral olivocochlear efferent dopamine release, what we increased, or the backup, uh, the endogenous protector, or the pejvakin, the peroxisome uh, system, which also uh, exert in normal situation a protective system, and the purines, uh, which are also endogenous uh, uh, transmitters, neuro neuromodulators, exerting protective uh, action. And the immune system, which is, uh, which has, uh, everybody knows, a genus uh, phase. Uh, in most of the cases, uh, the literature uh, believe uh, that the overactivation in the immune system rather cause uh, the defect uh, of the hearing system. But as I mentioned, this genus phase also raised the possibility to use the modulation of the immune system for protection. And uh, as I wrote in the abstract uh, as well, uh, 
these, uh, many of these drugs and approaches we used is kind of attacking uh, drugs with, uh, we use drugs with multi-target actions, overlapping effect, just to mention Selegilin, which has uh, 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 anti uh, uh, oxidant and anti apoptotic and neuroprotective action, but also activate the endogenous protective dopamine release. Uh, not to mention that seems that selegilin modulate also activate the immune uh, system. Okay, and now uh, just the end. Uh, let me. Uh, uh, list of thanks uh, for the contributors. Our small lab, uh, uh, my colleagues with Victoria and Judith nowadays, and Gabriella, uh, Daniel, Joanna, and Momen, uh, uh, PhD and uh, uh, student, uh, graduate student uh, colleagues, uh, Laszlo, who is a pre <coughs> specialist and contributing to that part of uh, the work. We are collaborating uh, at uh, our university with the ENT guys, uh, Anita, Gabor, uh, and Laszlo. Uh, on the immune checkpoint inhibitor topic, uh, we are collaborating uh, with Zoltan. Uh, my uh, 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 maternal uh, institute, I still uh, have a connection, uh, and uh, Beata Sperlak uh, is a pure energy specialist. We continue uh, the collaboration and with Dr. Vizi. Uh, the dopamine release uh, experiment uh, was done uh, with, uh, together with uh, my colleagues, uh, Anita uh, Balázs and Professor Vizi, the Page uh, University uh, guys, Balázs, Dora, uh, uh, and Andrea, uh, the Institute uh, Pasteur Group, Sedige and Christina Petty, uh, we worked together on the Page Joaquin uh, approach. Uh, uh, Gedon Richter uh, still supporting uh, our work. Uh, my colleagues uh, who uh, helped me to use the hemicochlear preparation, uh, George Halmos learned in Professor Dalos uh, laboratory, and we set it up uh, to use it for functional uh, imaging. And we got uh, uh, help uh, uh, from the University of Technology here at Budapest uh, from physicists who helped us in uh, the noise-induced uh, uh, experiment. And I also uh, thanks uh, again to Professor Dalos to teaching us uh, the hemicochlear preparation and Joash uh, Rafael uh, to teach us. Uh, Judith, my colleague, went uh, to the Kresge Institute in Arbor and uh, Joash uh, taught uh, her the uh, uh, counting, how to count uh, the heart cells. And at the end, uh, after this, just a, 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 a tiny uh, color uh, uh, story, I have no uh, connection. I did not have uh, the luck uh, to meet uh, Professor Bekeshi, but here is uh, Adam, my uh, previous uh, former PhD student uh, and colleague, who's grandmother, uh, she is in 90, uh, 98 years old now. He uh, learned pharmacy during the Second World War before uh, 44, and he took uh, a biophysics exam uh, at Professor uh, Bekeshi. He, she even uh, had the, the index, but unfortunately when Adam moved uh, uh, to Toronto to at sick kids, uh, he did not find it uh, now. Uh, but uh, his grandmother uh, was uh, taking an exam at Professor Bekeshi, and she failed. But, <laughs> but she, she got uh, the pharmacy, so later on she did not give up, and finally uh, reached the success. So this is my message also, that till now we are unlucky and unsuccessful to produce uh, a pharmacotherapy for a hearing loss, but I believe that this uh, community, community, the hearing researchers, are pretty close to come up uh, with a molecule which will help uh, on this uh, disease. So thanks uh, for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much for the wonderful talk, uh, uh, which we hope that to see indeed some therapeutic approaches. Uh, for sake of time, um, 
I, uh, we would like to proceed, but nevertheless, we would like to congratulate you. So now we arrive to the uh, last presentation of, uh, of this uh, symposium, which will be given by uh, uh, Professor Jozef Giza Kish, uh, Professor of Audiology at the University of Szeged, Albert Senior the Medical Center, Department of Otorino Laryngology, and Head and Neck Surgery. And the title of the presentation is The First Artificial Sensory Organ Cochlear Implant. Please, the floor is yours. Dear Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great honor I would be here because it was, they were invited to me to present it for my clinical works, uh, what is uh, uh, more everyday work and the more closer for the everyday practice, but it's very important. But that is a work when which way we have to help them for the <coughs> deaf people and also for the hearing impaired people to, to, to turning back again for the uh, hearing circumstances. It's a great honor to, to mention the George Bekeshi, who was one of my men, who was to show me for the way, which way we have to working and which way I followed for his career. Not only for the science, also for the like of the art, because I'm also liking for the art very deeply. Okay, what is the main problem for us to, which way we have to discover for the people who are suffering for the hearing loss and who is the, uh, have a problem for the, for the deafness? Because uh, in the Tibor mentioned it earlier, the, that is a, the hearing loss is one of the disease when it's touched for the most of the people, mostly for the elderly, <clears throat> but also so many young child who's the newborn people is also suffering from the, from, from the, the hearing loss and also for the deafness. Uh, it is a main target, which way we have to help them, which way we have to use for that and which way we have to help them to turning back for the hearing circumstances. First of all, it's a very important thing to find a way which we have to screen the people to find them, who is a real candidate to need help to both of the uh, different kind of the surgical treatment and also for different kind of the equipment we do that. Uh, earlier, we, uh, so many other people is talking about for the different kind of the methods in which we is possible to objectively measure for the hearing, both of the uh, elderly and both of the young child, but one of them both are acoustic emission. But it's a very interesting thing because of the hair cells are moving. If they are moving, they're producing a sound, and also is, the sound is uh, really uh, measurable for the outer ear if you have a very sensitive microphone. But why is not a real good uh, methods for that to, 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 to find the real patients who have a found a problem for the, for the hearing uh, disorders and also for that, because that is coming only for the inner ear. We don't find any other problem when the patients have the problem for the brainstem and maybe for the higher uh, part of the auditory pathway. And also it's a problem, but uh, sometimes it is not measurable because it's something that's blocking in the middle ear and, and outer ear for the, for the sound when it's coming out of the cochlea. But it's, uh, too many errors we have, to, mostly for the each 100 measurements, the 30 is failed. It's very complicated to do that. And that was a way, uh, way why we had to find another uh, kind of the measurements for the auditory brainstem responses to, to the screening method. Uh, it was a great discussion with worldwide which method is the better, but uh, the earlier everybody using for the for the auto acoustic emission until uh, 2017 we are using for the uh, based on the the, the auditory brainstem responses for this that things and they are suggested for the all of the worldwide and so many other people followed us after that uh, date. And also, if we have the screening for the patients, uh, uh, the screening for the peoples who is suffering for the deafness, we use it also for the genetic screening. But this also is very important to know what is the origin of the of the of the, of the deafness. What's the origin of the hearing loss? Which way we have to help them? Because if the 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 the, the origin of the deafness is maybe is some 
malformation or some other sign of, uh, sign of the, the, the problems is needed for the greatly different treatment, uh, different possibilities to solving for the problem. And if the, the, the origin is only for the touch for the hair cells, okay, and the, the auditory pathway is anyway is working without any problems, is most important to us to know that because they have to using for a different uh, treatment to help them uh, very easily because only for the hair assessment. At the moment, that was when I suggested for the cochlear implant because the cochlear implant is a device when it's an uh, art artificial device but it's uh, uh, helping to us to hear instead of our hearing. But so-called, sometimes this cochlear implant is a hair cells prothesis because they are working then because the, all of the procedures when it's coming to the outer ear, to the middle ear, to the inner ear is substitutable by this device. Okay, first of all, we can find a way, what's the problem? Uh, the problem is coming for the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear, because different sources for the different problems needed for different therapy. Okay, uh, if we have a problem for the uh, severe, not too severe, but moderate hearing loss, the best solution, the hearing aids. And sometimes also, if we have some problems for the sometimes in the middle ear, but maybe it's not working properly, but the inner ear is working properly, we need al always for the, for the bone conduction devices because that way we have to put it in the sound sources across the vibration via, via, the, via the bone conduction. This is also we have to find for the different equipment because both of the passive and active type of the things maybe depends on the, the vibration is, is possible to working outside or maybe for the inside of the, uh, the skull. And what will be a final solution if we have a real problems for the inner ear? Maybe for the, uh, for the hair cells or, or the cochlear uh, or maybe the cortical organs are not working. That solution is a cochlear implant. What is the cochlear implant exactly? I told you, but maybe it's so-called uh, uh, hair cells prothesis. Uh, the mostly they are the equipment uh, when it's uh, have a two different parts. One part of is for the, sorry, uh, when it's uh, the inner part, when it's we are uh, put it in under the uh, the skin, very close to the uh, to, to the skull, and maybe we have an electrode array when put it in to the to cochlea under the basilar membranes. Uh, maybe it is possible to fully or not. And also, if we have another parts of the uh, the equipment when it's outside, when so called speech processor, but nowadays it's a very tiny and very small things, but earlier it was, but at the beginning for the, for the 80s, it was like a great luggage for that, because that is a computer when they have to uh, preparing for the, our sound information and transforming for the electrical signal and transforming and uh, send it to back for the internal part and the internal part stimulate for the cochlea the different position and that stimulation when the when when the, when the stimulation is the target exactly for for the auditory nerve and maybe for the for the for the uh, uh, the cells in the in the in the in the uh, uh, in the cochlea, who is uh, receiving for the signals, and after the signal is passing through for the auditory pathway and cause the hearing sensation for the patients. Uh, and also it's possible sometimes to solve for the different solution if the patients have a central origin of the hearing loss, maybe some kind of the tumors causing for the trouble uh, for the brainstem, but it's also it's possible for the brainstem implant, but it's uh, working not too properly nowadays because very frequently and uh, mentioned for so many ethical questions, which way is possible to put it anything inside of the brain or not. Uh, only when we do the surgery to removing for some kind of the tumors on the brainstem area and put it in that kind of the equipment when it's helping to, to the patients after to, to receive them for some sound, sound information and maybe the producing them for the, some kind of the hearing uh, uh, solution. Okay, who is a person who's really uh, a candidate for the cochlear implant? If we could look looking for the children and the infants, because the, every children will be screened for the first five days of his life. 
okay? And if they are fine for the, for the things, but the, that kind of the method, immediately they put it in for, the, uh, for some, somewhere in the, uh, in, the, in, in the clothes, and everybody knows that who's the patient who need care. Okay. If the patients have a bilateral severe hearing loss uh, for the inner ear origin, that's the real candidates. For the adults, uh, sometimes they could hear earlier, and maybe for the, his lifetime, he's losing for the hearing. And also, if that losing of the hearing, it's a problem is coming to the inner ear, not in the brainstem, for example, and not only for the cortical area, because so many other problems is possible, uh, they also is a good candidate. If their speech perception is less than 30 and 50%, and uh, also is needed for the uh, discussion for the, what is the uh, contraindication problems. Maybe uh, if they don't have any contraindication to the surgery and anesthesia, they are also is a very good candidate. And also is very important to do that for some imaging because the imaging is showed me both of the CT or, or MRI pictures and sometimes for the for the ultrasound pictures to give me for some information. Maybe the co what is the structure of the cochlea? The cochlea is have the malformation, for example, or maybe the exit of the cochlea, exit of the auditory nerve. If they are not exit, maybe we don't have to use it for that kind of defect because we need the place when we put it for our electrodes, when it's stimulate for the auditory nerve and maybe for the ganglion spiral cells to, to give them for the information uh, and to send it to the, to, the, to the signal for the auditory pathway to give uh, the patients for the hearing sensation. Okay, uh, that's kind of the imaging we use it for because as the Selection criteria, exactly, because if the patients have the problem, is not. Sometimes if the patients have a malformation, we need to, 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 to prepare for the three-dimensional printing for the, for the special cochlea to try it, which we have to using to the surgery is possible exactly or not, but maybe some kind of the malformations help, uh, some kind of the malformations also is useful to, to, to this kind of the treatment. Okay. How the cochlear implants work? We put it for the electrode array, exactly for under the basilar membranes, uh, chronically, and stimulate for the ganglion cells, or maybe for the end part of the auditory nerve. Uh, the system is a little bit similar than the normal hearing because that's kind of the stimulation. Uh, if it's enough strong, producing for the hearing sensation of the patients. If it's not enough strong, maybe not. If it's too strong, maybe destroyed for the cochlea, and maybe causing for the painful for the patients. It's very important. We know that what is the distribution of the of the of the of the hair cells and which hair cells are functioning for which area of the frequency. And that is the reason we know that for the apical part of the cochlea are mostly uh, for, the, uh, for the low frequency uh, is important and, and the basic part is mostly for the higher frequency. That is the reason we need for the whole cochlea are, are uh, involving for the, for the stimulation. Uh, what is the part? Okay, the, the, I told you for we have an internal part. When uh, this is a, also for the microcomputer when it's selected for the different kind of the stimulation and sending to, to to the cochlea, and also for the other outer part when it's also for the microcomputer who is receiving for the signals for the for for, for, the, for the surround us and uh, making for some signal processing to to send it to the back for the information to 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 the to the internal part. Okay, that's is a simple things when we showed for the small child which way is working. Okay, but something is uh, have a hearing impaired patient who receiving for this implant, and somebody tell them some words like hello, and it is coming to the microphone. The microphone send it to the pr speech processor. This some kind of this, uh, the signal processing is going on, and maybe after this specific signal, we'll send it to the cross for the transmitter to, to loop, to the, to the, to the uh, receiver loop, uh, because uh, inductively is transferring for the information. And that time for the inner, inner internal part is producing for the electrical stimulation branch to, to send it to the cochlea, depends on which area, for the basilar or apical area, and give them for the hearing sensation for the patients for the low tone and the high tone. Of course, and initially is not a real hearing information, but the patients who is growing up together with that kind of the equipment, they immediately receiving what is the sound, all right? They, they are grown up for like that. And what is my, uh, our dreams? Our dreams is exactly for that. If we do that earlier, if it is possible, the patients has got it for that for less than a year old, when after he's born like a deaf, maybe he's growing up and going to the normal nursery in a normal school together with the normal hearing person. Uh, we don't have to discriminate and differentiate between the each other. 
Okay, uh, which kind of the preoperative testing we use it? Also the objective measurement we used, using for team permanent fee, uh, uh, we using for the step ADR reflex, autoacoustic emission, when so many people is, uh, mentioned that, but it's uh, one of the important things to know that which way the inner ear is working, and also for using for the different kind of the evoke potential system. Mostly we need to know that what's the problem with the inner ear, maybe the cochlear part, what, what, what's the problem for maybe the, the brainstem, and what's the, what's the problem for the cortical area. Okay, and also what is the most important to know also, because if we have a patient, if we have selected, we need to do the surgery, okay? But, uh, you know, for, if we are trying to do the surgery for a very small child who is uh, less than a year old, uh, it's not easy to do that because the equipment is also is, uh, not, a, uh, not the simplest because it's a high tech uh, equipment, and also for the, the baby who is need to do the surgery, is also is, uh, we need to, to, to save them, and it means it uh, needed very specific circumstances, which has helped me. It's, we don't do the failure, for example. We don't do any other things when it's not working well. This is the reason we need to, uh, uh, the, the intraoperative high-tech <coughs> imaging, and also we need for something for the postoperative because we need to know that we do exactly that when we want, to put it the, uh, electrodes exactly for the, the, the place when we need to do that because that way we, they are working only. Uh, and also we do uh, so many uh, high uh, so many uh, electrophysiological measurements as necessary, intraoperatively, preoperatively, and postoperatively, because that's helped me to, to find a way which way you have to follow the patients. Be, the, what is the final result? They get the results, they, they have a hearing, and which, which, which kind of the hearing they, uh, he, they have, and maybe uh, what's that? And also, is a question. Mm -hmm. We do the surgery unilaterally or bilaterally. Uh, when I was asking for, sometimes for uh, the, 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 the insurance people, who uh, decided that, okay, the double implant is means double price, okay? But what's the originally? Originally, each humans have two ears. Okay, the one ear, if they have a hearing, and another ear, we have a hearing, is not exactly 50-50, because if somebody have one ear, they have to listen to everything, and they have to, uh, to hear everything, but the second ear is not give them for the 50-50 information, but if we have to localize for the hearing, it's needed for our two ears, okay? Why we don't give them the same chance for the, our patients? Okay, we need to do that for the, the double side if it is possible, except, that cases when the patient have a single-sided deafness, but it's also very specific uh, cases. All right, uh, which way we do that? Uh, one seat or two seats? We do that the surgery for each after the several months or several years later, or do that exactly for the same seats both side. If uh, the surgery circumstances enough good, and we do the enough uh, quick surgery, we do that the same seats for both sides, because it's one trauma for the patients, not two times of the trauma, and we need to, to don't need to do that to two times for the whole procedure again. Okay. Uh, the single-sided deafness I told you earlier, but maybe that's not a best candidate for that kind of the patients, because they have a one very good hearing for one side, and they don't have any hearing for another side. What they can do, because if they have another, uh, kind of another goal of the hearing for another side because they have a, a, have a equipment, they have a problems because they are not in immediately working well. Okay, they need some learning effect. Each kind of the patient receiving for the implant needed minimum two years preparing when they have a really uh, uh, to, uh, good uh, hearing performances and maybe they have to, uh, they're really uh, working with them. It means if somebody have a very good hearing for one side, maybe they are really neglected sometimes. It's not, not the good things is needed for real self-stimulation to, to working with that kind of the things, okay? Uh, we do for the surgery for the, our uh, uh, clinic to do nice circumstances uh, in, involving for the interoperative uh, imaging and also for interoperative uh, different kind of the electrophysiological circumstances. And sometimes we need it for a construction for three-dimensionally for the different images because it's very important to know that. Uh, only for one thing, because what's the difference between the small child skull and the, and, and, and the adult skull? The cochlea are same. 
The cochlea are not increasing after the boarding because only for the skull is changing for the shape and, and a little bit for the size. It means the cochlea are not needed to changing for the equipment. If we use for the equipment for the early, very early ages, like less than a year, and maybe for the if you use for the for the 20 years later and 80 years later, the patients are not changed because the cochlea are not changed because the equipment is ready to, to inside. Okay, what's the intraoperative examination? We need to, 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 to do, why, why, why we need intraoperative measurements? Because you can imagine, we have a one year old child, they are not communicate because they are deaf. Okay, which way they have to find the threshold level of him? Because we need to, to stimulate for some kind of the uh, uh, electrical uh, signals, which is a level of his hearing. We have a very specific equipment uh, uh, because we have so many electrodes inside of the cochlea. It means it's possible to what electrode is stimulated for the for the neural structures around them, and another two electrodes pick up the potentials. If they have a potentials, okay, maybe it's a good level for the threshold because that kind of the uh, stimulation is enough load to get a hearing. And also, it's very important to find a, a top level when it's uh, enough good hearing for them, enough good hearing sensation, but not painful. That is also is a good thing for the stapedial reflex because the stapedial reflex is a uh, is a protective reflex because uh, normally, if the normal hearing person, the 80 or 90 decibel uh, sound, uh, give the stimulation to, for the, for the contract for the stapedial muscle, and that showed me okay, the loudest sound. So long time they cause the hearing uh, uh, trouble. Okay, if we are measured for the intraoperative subpedial reflex, for electrical stimulation, and also for neurotelemetry, we can find for the threshold level, and we can find for the uh, for the uh, comfort level of the patient, and maybe for the one year old child, when they switch on the equipment, they have a range, or is uh, really uh, have a sound information for that. And also, if we have to find for several kind of the of the uh, measurement like uh, uh, electrocochleography and also for trans impedance geometrics because we need to know that what is the impedance for the electrodes inside of the cochlea. If they are not working, if they are not a real good, uh, uh, how can I say, for uh, uh, impedance, but maybe the, the, we have a, a malfunction of the oil of the, uh, of the uh, equipment. Sorry? The trans impedance matrix showed me. Uh, what is the problem? But maybe for the for the uh, the electrode is not a good place. Maybe not put it in for the cochlea. Maybe put it in somewhere for the for the different places. Maybe put it in for the for the vestibular organ for some other place. But they have a different uh, uh, shape for the for this kind of the diagrams. Help me immediately inside of the. Uh, 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 operating theater, what is a good place exactly and working? Because it's two information give me. Immediately, maybe for the device is working, because it's a very expensive device, approximately in Hungary more than uh, 8 million forints, uh, brutto. And also, uh, we need to know again for the patients have a hearing, because they are uh, show me for the, the results, okay? Uh, it's also is possible to measure for the intercochlear electrocochlear business. It's very important to to measuring for the, to save the remain hearing uh, for the hearing preservation. Because if we preserve for the hearing, maybe the hearing is not a good one. Maybe it's uh, ex exactly for the 80 or 90 decibel. It's very very uh, low range. But if the hearing is remain, it means we don't destroy it for the uh, for the cochlea by the surgery way, okay? Because if the electrode ray is not pulling a real place, okay? And maybe the passing through for the basilar membrane and destroying for the corti organs, maybe we cause any trouble for the, for, 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 the, for the internal structure of the cochlea. This is a possibility to, to, to measure some kind of the, the, the measurements. If they show me, if we put it inserted in the electrode slowly, 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 and we can recognize if they're touched for the basilar membranes, maybe the surgery surgeon is stopped a bit, and after slowly, slowly again, to pull it safely to the electrode array into the cochlea. That's very helped me to that. 
Okay, and also be used for the facial nerve monitoring, but it's also is very important because the facial nerve is closing, uh, running very close to the to the to the to the, to the uh, round and, and oval window, and maybe sometimes is uh, we have a trouble for that. Maybe the patients after the surgery have a facial palsy, as also is not good for the patients. And also sometimes after the, uh, we have a good insertion, maybe for the stimulation, causing for any facial nerve effect, because not only for the hearing will be stimulated after by the electrical signal, maybe the facial nerve is also is uh, uh, stimulatable. Uh, that is the electrical glaucoma is very important when we have to comparing for the intraoperative and, and preoperative ISSR uh, measurements and also for the cochlear. And they really show me we are don't change everything for this hearing preservation. Maybe for the cochlear internal part, we are not damaged, we are not destroyed. Either. Okay, that is a measurement for the cochlear, uh, for the, for the, this is a stapa tendon, right? This is the muscle of the sta uh, uh, muscular stapedius when it's really contracted if we are stimulated for the, for the, for the, for the patients, for the electrical stimulation, each of the channels, because we have 22 channels, for example, inside. And uh, if the sta stapedia is, is, is have a reflex, okay, we can calculate that's a, uh, uh, the top part when we stimulate for the cochlea, and maybe we are not causing any trouble for the patients. Okay. Also, the possibilities to 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 measure it for the when I showed you the, the neuroresponse neuro telemetry, there's a uh, action compound potentials because we are stimulate for two electrodes and pick up the potentials for another two electrodes uh, for for the for the for the nerve uh, structure and this is a really recognizable which is the smallest level for the intensity when we could producing for the hearing uh, sensation of the patients because it's very important for the very young child because they are not communicate with us uh, less than two and three years old Sometimes it's also possible to, to, to using for the system intraoperatively for the electrically evoked uh, brainstem evoked response audiometry or RBR because it also is helping me if we are evoked for the potentials maybe for the patients have a hearing, okay, have a hearing sensation. Um, it should be and also for the intraoperative uh, radiological examination we uh, recognize for the both of the two equipment for the, for the, uh, the live set you can see for the both of them, this is the electrode inside of the cochlea, both sides, and this is a, uh, another picture for, 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 for the lateral side, but it's, uh, of, of course, because this is an x-ray, uh, all of the equipment, uh, you, you, you can use it parallel for each other. This is also very important to recognize immediately, because we don't need for the second day and, and after the second day, the new surgery to the small child. We need to know that the, 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 uh, the equipment exactly for the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the size when they have it. Also, you can know it for, to which we have the electrodes are positioning inside, okay? It's very good because, you know, when you remember for the, for the topic, topical area for the, for, the, for, the, for the cochlea, which is a lower and which is a higher frequency, which way the electrodes array are reach them. Okay, and also sometimes it's necessary when I told you if we have a, some malformation of the, of the cochlea, we need to, to the 3D uh, the, uh, modeling for the, for, the, for, the, for the cochlea after by the CT or MRI pictures, maybe for the pictures. Uh, uh, how can I say to, to correlate it to each other? And after we have the planning to do that, and maybe for the 3D uh, printing is also helping me to, to find which way we have to, 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 to plan into the surgery. And it's also helping me which kind of the electrode array we need to choose it because some cochlea are shorter, some cochlea are wider, some cochlea are malformated. It's needed for a different kind of the electrodes of, of the patients. Okay? This is also, you can see it for the intraoperative imaging for the both sides of the electrodes. Okay, why we do that so many procedures? Or why is it important? Because if you know, uh, which is a, our goals, early if it is possible, small as device if it is possible, and safest if it is possible, because that's uh, three things when to give the chance for the, for, for the patients to do it uh, early. Okay, what is the programming? The programming is a signal processing and we need to know which channels uh, and which electrodes array and which electrodes are uh, reaching for which kind of the frequency range if we are producing. And, you know, again, what is the things? Because, okay, normally we have a sound, 
the sound have a different kind of physical parameters, amplitude, frequency, phase, and any other one. Which way we do it for the electrical signal? The electrical signal, the inputs, what they have, which kind of the parameters they have. They have an intensity, they have a pulse width, they have an interstimulus interval, and they have a frequency. That's kind of the uh, parameters when we need to transfer them to the sound parameters to that, because that's helped me to do the real information for the patients, but, but they need to, to really help them to hear. And that is the reason we need always to calculate which kind of the coding strategy is important to the patients to give them for the best chance. And the earlier treatment only to give me a chance only for to hear something when it was the, the late 80s. And later it was the speech understanding, that the speech production also. What's the nowadays situation? The need to, to enjoy for the music. Because so many of our patients are paying piano, paying to guitar, and also for dancing. But it's needed to, to, they have so many information, and so most nice and finest information than that earlier. Okay, uh, this is interesting for the, uh, how the, uh, uh, the coding strategy are working. This is a three important coding strategy that I have to show you, but uh, for the, these three images showed for the things, and they are the electrodes array there, you know? And this is a, a choice word, yeah, both sides, okay? They are, you see, for the time, the x-axis, and they are, uh, you can see for the 22 electrodes, yeah? Okay, and the choice, it means a choice, it's a, it's a, it's a high frequency sound, okay? It means it must be a basic part of the cochlear, and, and, the, and the O, it must be a low frequency, it must be for the top of the cochlear, okay? And if we can use it for this kind of the S-peak loading strategy, it means for the, the, the best amplitudes and best frequency we can choose it, and, uh, and, and uh, the coding strategy, and if, uh, for the signal processing, and they stimulate for that part of the cochlea when that frequency are needed, okay? What we do for the stimulation, we put it in the charge. And if we put it in more charge, it means more information per second, okay? But if they have a limit. We don't have to put it so many charge for the same seconds because we are destroying for the cochlea after. It, we need to find an optimal part, how many charges possible per second, because that's limited for what kind of the information we have to, to put it in for the patients in one second, okay? And the second one, you can use it for, we don't use for both of the 20 electrodes, we have used less number of the electrodes, but the spectrum is more niceable. That way, the patients have a more speech understanding. Okay, and the final solution nowadays, so many people using for the mix of that too, because the better spectral resolution, both of the time resolution is the spectrum and both of the amplitude resolution, and also we use both of the, uh, the electrodes, but it's helping for the patients to, to the best uh, sound information and best hearing information. Okay, the postoperatively also we do so many uh, electrophysiological measurements, we need to follow the patients. It's if we do the surgery, it's not enough. Okay, the surgery, it means they have a chance to get an information, they have a chance, they have an equipment, when they maybe give them for hearing information. It means day by day, week by week, month by month, they come to back to, to fit the equipment exactly for personally that patients, okay? And also is needed for the postoperative X-ray because, because we need to know that if something happened, maybe the patients have a uh, traffic accident, maybe the patients have some trouble and maybe uh, fell down, uh, and uh, we need to know what was the original position of the equipment and what the rate of position. If the, the equipment moving uh, less than a millimeter size for electrode, it may be, it may be it's, it's a huge trouble for the patient. Maybe with some kind of the loudnesses will be very high, and sometimes the loudness is it's very low. We have some kind of the patients who have some uh, F, F, uh, traffic accident, and may, we need to immediately change for his programming. And uh, what is the, uh, the following for the patients? Okay, the first fit for the equipment for the patients is after the uh, week, of, uh, four week of the surgery, because that's needed for the healing. Because we do the electrical signal in the, in the cochlea, it means for the, uh, uh, the circumstances of the, of, the, of the tissue, what is the electrical impedance of the tissue, this is very important. Okay, it's needed for minimum four weeks to, 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 to go back to the healing, okay? And later it's coming back for different kind of the months, and uh, after if the, the best fitting equipment is needed for twice a week. And also it's very important to, 
if we use for two implants, we need to find which way they have to 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 study and to, to reach them for the information where the sound is coming. Okay, we build up for the very specific laboratory when it's possible to determine it for which way the implant user can find for the uh, the, the direction selection for for the sound source. Okay, and also it's very important after it. We need to follow the patients, what is the cognitive increasing, the cognitive developing for, because if they are receiving for the sounds and maybe some sometimes later they not receiving for the sounds, maybe we, they, the, this, uh, they are, the, 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 the knowledge, they, they know it, what is that sound, and maybe they, after they understanding for what is that sound, and that way uh, his cognitive procedure is increasing. And need, need to also following, that is the reason we sometimes the measuring for the, uh, the cortical evoke potentials and sometimes for the P300, it means the cognitive potentials too, if the patient's enough or, uh, old. Okay, and finally, what is our ultimate goal? To integrating the hearing impaired people into the hearing community to be, uh, become a full members of their society because if the patients are deaf, if the patients are hearing impaired, they don't have to go to the high school, they don't have to go for their, their specific uh, work uh, and they have specific workplace because they are uh, uh, not as similar than the normal hearing people. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank you for my colleagues, for all of the, our teams. Uh, involving for the surgeons, uh, audiologists, neurologists, and uh, physicists and engineers, and also for thanks again for George von Bekish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Maybe one quick question. This this was like magic, really. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> can you use artificial intelligence in? Uh, yes, we use in, uh, programming. Uh, why I explained for that all of that work because we are working together with the uh, with the firms who is building for the equipment, okay? And we are helping to them to do that smallest, safest, and long life things because that is the most important thing to do that because we have a uh, so many experience for that at the moment in Hungary till 1985 approximately one and one and a half thousand people implanted. Okay, and in our uh, teams do that approximately more than 800 and 900 to do that. It's 900 people change life. I'm it's sure. a great thing. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you very much. And then, uh, and, uh, by paying you respect and uh, thank you for your contribution. So this is the, and this is the level. Unfortunately. <laughs> 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 So we have uh, come to the conclusion of, uh, of this wonderful uh, symposium uh, in tribute to uh, uh, Gerhard uh, von Bekeshi. I'm, I'm, I have become convinced that this was a very wonderful, a truly wonderful uh, experience for all of us. And uh, it's a pride to uh, know that von Bekeshi started in Budapest and uh, and uh, made it all, all the way to the Nobel Prize and made a fundamental discovery and fundamental contribution to understanding uh, the fascinating, uh, fascinating mechanisms of human hearing. And in this symposium uh, made a overview, a fantastic overview of what has developed since his discovery from the molecular level all the way to the clinical level as we have heard it. I think there's much to learn, much to be done in the future, but I think there's good hope uh, having seen these wonderful presentations. So with that, I want to thank all of our contributors and also want to pass the word, the final word to my co-chair, uh, Professor Pony. Okay, uh, thank you very much and uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the audience. Thank you very much for the speakers and uh, also uh, Thank you very much for uh, everybody who listened to the uh, talk on the uh, internet, and I hope the uh, broadcast was also perfect in that sense as well. Uh, we have several conclusions today. We heard uh, how uh, the uh, field progressed, 
And we, biophysics chairmen, we also learned that we have to rewrite the books very, very soon uh, as a <laughs> consequence of these uh, uh, fundamental discoveries and our current understanding of the uh, state of art of hearing. So thank you very much for everybody, and uh, I wish uh, that we can continue it at one point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.